was keeping up with all that, and they said, get, give, them, give them folks a star this morning. Because they love the Lord. We're glad you're here. And buddy Sam stopped right to behave this morning. His big brother Jeff, sir, and sister-in-law Kathy right there with him. He likes to behave. I know it's hard on you, Sam. But just <laughs> Good to have all of you that are here. Any other visitors, uh, uh, looks like the regular folks, and I all appreciate it very much. Just want to tilt my hat, if I had a hat, uh, to our Jeremy York and uh, all the work he did up in Gatlinburg for several days and about 10,000 sandwiches. <laughs> uh, one morning he fixed 60 pots of coffee for the folks up there and the workers and, and of course uh, Amy and Allie went up for a few days and Donnie and Kathy Loftus took uh, supplies up there for them and stayed and helped. Uh, they put into practice what some folks talked about Amen, and that's tremendous. And the church here did send a good contribution to the church up there in Gatlinburg, as well as uh, they did help Jeremy some on his supplies and such. So uh, uh, a lot of good deeds. And uh, sort of like Dolly Parton said on uh, uh, Royal News tonight, uh, Friday evening there, David Muir was talking to her, and she said, I'm telling you, these Tennessee folks are givers. And uh, they are. And uh, holiday folks are givers, too. Well, the lesson this morning is titled The Nature of God. The Nature of God. Last Sunday we were blessed to have a good Bible class and sermon by Brother Bob Bishop. And I am excited the decision the elders have made. I believe Bob and family will be a good fit for us and be a help to the work. We really need it right now. It's a, an encouragement and I believe uh, he brings a lot of knowledge and talent and personality and uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. But in his lesson last week, Bob talked about Jonah and the anger of Jonah when God decided he would not destroy Nineveh. He changed his mind. And and old Jonah got just as mad as a wet hen. I mean, he just, just tore him all to pieces. He it made him look foolish. He'd gone through the streets walking and crying out, 40 days, 40 days, 40 days, you're going to all be destroyed. Then God changed his mind and decided to save them all. Made him look bad. Made him look foolish, you know. And he just pouted up and took off and went out and sat on, sat on top of a hill and said, I'll just sit up here and watch what all was going on. But Bob made the point that Jonah said in uh, chapter 4 and well, verses 1 and 2, we've got uh, that it displeased Jonah exceedingly that God decided to uh, spare the cities exceedingly. And he was very angry. Can you imagine... 120,000 people are saved. He gets mad about it because he didn't do what he's, you know, he, he made him look bad. Next verse, uh, verse 2. So Jonah prayed to the Lord. Now I pray the O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew. Now remember that. I said this before I ever left Tarshish. Uh, before I ever headed for Tarsus. Of course, his plan was, uh, God said go to Nineveh. That would have been to the east. He's over here in the Bible lands, Israel. or uh, Yeah, Israel. And so uh, go east to Nineveh. No, no, no. He got over here to the seacoast at Joppa and got on a boat heading for Tarsus, which is in the west. Exact opposite. Nineveh's here. Tarsus is here. He's going that way. He's running from God. And um, so... He said, I knew before I ever left, you would do exactly this. I knew it. I knew. I knew. How would you know? I, I knew that I art a gracious God. I knew you're a merciful God. I know you're slow to anger. And I know you are great kindness. And therefore, I knew you would repent of this evil you have planned for these people. How did he know it? That's what I want you to think about just for a moment. He says, I knew. I knew. I knew you'd do this. How did you know, Jonah? To our knowledge, God didn't tell him these things. I mean, he, we can't turn to any passage of Scripture where God says, Okay, Jonah, I tell you, I'm gracious, I'm merciful, I'm slow to anger, and I'm very kind-hearted. We don't have it. It's not in the Bible. Jonah doesn't say, God, you told me these things. He didn't say that now. I heard you in a sermon, God, say, no, no, no. I, well, the priest said, no, don't have any of that. How did he know? He knew by observation. He knew by his own life observing the nature of God, perhaps, I think. 
And I think he knew the nature of God by seeing it in the lives of other people around him. He saw the nature of God, he observed it, and therefore he knew that's probably what you're going to do. And God did it. We learn a lot by observation. That's what Jonah did. How do you know somebody's stingy? They, they usually don't wear a t-shirt that says, I am stingy. I've, I've never seen that. <laughs> um, I've never seen anybody wear a t-shirt that says, I am generous either. Or I'm a good giver. Or No. How do you know somebody's stingy? Well, you just observe it. They're tight with their money. They don't help other people. They're not thoughtful of others. They're, they're, I mean, they show up with a lot of you work beside them. You know at the factory or, or the office. Uh, in your family, there's certain people in the family that's got a reputation for being stingy, tight. And it's just proven. They don't wear shirts that declare it. But we observe that because they don't help other people. They're not a free-hearted giver. How do you know somebody's a gossip? They don't wear t-shirts that says, I'm a big gossiper. No, we, we, we watch them. We listen to them. They're always running down people. They're always talking about other people. They're, got the, they're quick and judgmental and they're harsh and mean-spirited. They don't wear a shirt that says, I am mean-spirited. They don't go around saying, I'm a mean-spirited person. I'm a big gossip over there at Holiday. They don't do that. But how do we know? We know them by their fruits, Jesus said. We know by observing if somebody is greedy, a gossip, mean-spirited, generous, sweet, and kind, we know by the fruits of their life. Um, yes. I believe that's how Jonah knew that God would do these things because he had observed it by his relationship with God and in the lives of others. Just a little background for Jonah reaching this conclusion before he reaches that conclusion. Let's look at Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, verse 2. I want you to arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, 120,000 people plus. Their wickedness has come up before me, our father said. They were a wicked people. They, they had a reputation of being very violent and mean, evil. Uh, they would skin people alive and put them, um, on, the, put them on a stake or a, uh, a post and line the street to the entrances into Nineveh. Uh, this, these are not crosses, but just they would put bodies uh, on sticks, or on poles, and stuck in the ground. And this would be your welcome committee. If you're thinking about coming into the, you better know where you're, what you're getting into. They were a wicked people. Verse 3, Jonah, he rose up to flee unto Tarsus, as I said, opposite direction. And what he was doing was trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. Now, twist, uh, the presence of the Lord will be twice mentioned in this verse. There it is, the last part of the verse. So he's trying to run away from God, to get away from the presence of the Lord. You can't do that. Are you trying to do that today? Am I trying to do that? You can't do that. You know, it's the old illustration, uh, the billfold that's found on the side of the road with a daddy and a boy walking along, and the daddy sees the billfold, and he picks it up, and he looks here, and he looks there, and he looks all around and he sticks it in his pocket. And going on down the road, and the little boy said, Daddy, you forgot to look up. Yeah, forgot to look up. Uh, in the presence of the Lord, you can't run away from it. David said in Psalms 139 and verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? Verse 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there, if I make my bed in hell, and the Hebrew word is Sheol, or the Hadean world, not hell of fire and brimstone, but the Hadean world, where the dead go. If I make my bed in Hades, thou art there. If I take up the wings of the morning and dwell into the uttermost parts of the sea, you ever been way out on the sea, far from land? God's there. And even thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will hold me. If I say, surely the darkness has covered me up, why, even the night shall be light about me. Yet the darkness um, hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. So, Jonah, you're, you're trying to do something you're not going to succeed in. Neither will we if we try to run from God. Well, verse 4, God caused a great wind to come up in chapter 1. Verse 6, the shipmaster woke Jonah up 
and said, Oh, sleeper, don't you call upon your God? We're in trouble here, brother. We've got a storm going on. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. In verse 9, he says, Well, I'm going to tell you, men, I'm a Hebrew. I fear God, the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. I'm the one causing all this trouble. What you need to do is just throw me overboard. Well, they tried everything in the world. They didn't want to do that. And finally, about verse 14, they said, Well, Lord, we pray that you not hold us responsible, but we're going to have to do this if we're going to make it and be saved. Verse 15, so they took up Jonah and they cast him forth into the sea, and then there was a ceasing. Well, that's when the men feared exceedingly, verse 16 says. In 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Um... This is the proper description of what God created, what God prepared. God created this universe, okay? God made it possible that multitudes could be fed with just a few loaves and fishes. God's had the power to raise the dead. God's had the power to, by miracles, to do many wondrous things. God could make a fish so great, so huge, that it would have a belly in it big enough Remember, maybe even more than one, I don't know. But there was at least one that was big enough for there to be oxygen, for there to be the ability for Jonah not to drown, but to be able to survive. The skeptics laugh at this. The skeptics make fun of us for believing in Jonah being in the belly of the whale. But it's by faith that we believe what the Bible says. Now, Jesus quotes this in Matthew 12. The King James uses the word whale, which is not good. It's not a whale. That's an improper translation. I know whale's a big, huge creature, but the correct description in the Hebrew and in the Greek of Matthew 12 is a great fish that God prepared. I'm telling you, you've heard me say this before, it may have gone all the way to the belly of that fish from here to the courthouse in Cookville. I don't know how big it was. I don't know how large it was, but I know God prepared it, and I know God made it big enough, and to be parts or places within the belly of that fish that Jonah could have lived for three days and three nights. I believe that, and I know you do, but it shows to us the power of God, and this is a miracle that Jesus quotes as taking place, and he said, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He did not hedge or he did not say, well, there's an old story about this or this is a parable. Uh, he said it was and it happened. Jonah was there. Jonah was. And we believe what the Lord said. Verse 1 of chapter 2, inside the belly of this great fish God prepared, Jonah's praying. <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious what a person would be doing, but it's sincere. And in verse 4 he says, I will look again toward thy holy temple. What is this? Repentance. He prayed in verse 1, and he promises, if I can get out of here, Lord, I promise you, I will look again to the holy temple of God. I, I'll do right. Give me another chance, Lord, please. Well, verse 10 says of chapter 2, the Lord God spake to the fish. There's another miracle. God talked to the fish. He made it. He has the ability to speak to it. And it vomit out Jonah upon the dry ground. Now, verse chapter 3 and verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. I like that. Our God is a God of second chances. Praise the Lord. Hey, how many of us have had that second chance and, and others, you know, and we praise God that it's not one strike and you're out. Uh, that God forgives sinners when we repent. Jonah's repented. He wants to go back to the temple of God. Jonah is given a second chance. What does he do with it? Go, verse 2, to Nineveh. Preach to him. Verse 3, he goes to Nineveh. It was a great city, a three days journey. Now, in three days, we could walk to Gainsborough from here, 20 miles, it wouldn't be too hard. But if we were to go to, say, we could go to Cookville, and we could walk around all the streets, all the different roads and highways, and all the way up Jefferson, all the way up Willow, all across Jackson, and we could 
We could walk and we could walk. We could walk three days and never get finished walking around Cookville, couldn't we? Not repeat ourselves. Just a little old Cookville, a little old Cookville. So don't, don't let this uh, become a problem to you. I mean, it was a great city. It's got a, at least 120,000 people within it. That's a lot better, bigger than Cookville. So, yes, he, he wasn't necessarily walking in a straight line that you could walk from here to Gainesboro in three days, but he's walking about the streets and the city and going here and there, all in the great city of Nineveh. It was a great city. And he told him in verse 4, you've got 40 days. And verse 5 says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. That's where you got to start. They proclaimed a fast. Going to not eat, show their dedication. They put on sackcloth and ashes from the greatest to the least of them. And then verse 5 tells us the king got involved. He said, listen, I, I believe old Jonah. I'm, I'm one of you. I'm right in there with you. <clears throat> and in, he even gave a proclamation in verse 8 that every man should turn from his evil way. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn or change his mind and repent? Uh, he will decide not to destroy us. That's what the king's reasoning was. And we perish not. Verse 10, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. They turned from their evil way. That's what repentance is. You've got a change of mind followed by change in your life. They believe God. They turned from their evil way. And God repented. God changed his mind of the evil that he had planned to destroy them all that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. God can change his mind. He did that with the days of Noah. He decided he would destroy the world. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God changed his mind and did not destroy them. Verse chapter 4 now, that's where we started this morning. Oh, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He's very angry. That's where he says, I, I knew. I pray in the Lord. I pray the old Lord was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country. When I was still in Israel, I told you. I told some people. I don't know who he told. But he said, I said it. That when I, you're gracious, you're merciful, you're slow to anger, you're a great kindness. And you, you'll repent of this. Verse 3, therefore now, O Lord, I take my life. Verse 4, I love this question. Dost thou do well to be angry? <laughs> don't, don't, do you see a little bit of the personality of God here? The personality of the Lord just a little bit here. Have you seen a little child just throw a fit? And you said to them, now do you feel better about that? Uh, maybe you gave them a little hickory tea to help them feel better. But uh, they threw a little bit of a fifth there. And Now, did it, did it do you any good to get angry? Jonah, son, are you any better off because you've thrown yourself a little fit? Oh, he's, he's spoiled. And he's, uh, he gets on verse 5. He's going to climb up on top of the hill and got him a little booth there to sit under. And he's just going to watch it all happen. Verse 6, the Lord God prepared a gourd. That's the King James Version. Uh, the New King James Version says prepared a plant, P-L-A-N-T. We don't know what type of plant, but King James calls it a gourd. That's all right. I know what a gourd is. And so it came uh, and had some leaves to it. This gourd, this plant, became a little shelter in this extreme heat. But there's a worm came along, and uh, verse 7, and the worm bit the plant in two, and so it died and dried up. And I tell you what, old, old Jonah, he's, uh, uh, he's just very sad about that. In verse 10, the Lord said, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, nor made it to grow. It came up in the night and it perished in the night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? Simple but powerful point. It really bothered. I, I, I don't understand the whole. I know the plant gave him some shade, some from the heat, and then it died, and it's not any value to it. Now. And it really disappointed him. It really has pity. God says, "You, you, you, you pity that old gourd, that old plant that's nothing." And here's 120,000 people I've saved. It shows his misplaced values. It shows how warped it was. 
that he got mad because God didn't do what he said he would do and, or had him to say what was going to happen. Instead of being thankful and rejoicing, he has misplaced values. He's not thinking right. Powerful text. But he does describe the nature of God in verse 2 that he does have an understanding of that's really the heart of this whole thing. He said, I knew you would do this. Because, first of all, he said, I know you're gracious. What does gracious mean? Kindness toward um, undeserving people. That's, you're gracious, you're kind to people that don't deserve to be treated kindly. I think of Simon, no, I think of the, uh, Saul of Tarsus, how he persecuted and killed Christians, and yet God had an interest in him and appeared to him and challenged him to change, and he did change and repented and obeyed the gospel. He was gracious to Saul, who says he was the chief of sinners. In Exodus 33 and verse 19 is a good reference concerning God's grace. Exodus 33 and 19. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. That's when Moses wanted to see God. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. What was it that Jonah said? I know you're a gracious God. God said, I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy. In chapter um, um, 34, verses 5 through 8 of Exodus, the Lord descended in a cloud and stood and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him, proclaimed the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth. God is gracious. Joel described it in Joel chapter 2 and um, verses 12 and 13. Joel 2, 12, 13. Therefore the Lord also now saith, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all of your heart, with all of your fasting, with, with your weeping and with mourning, and render your heart and not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. That's a direct quote from what Jonah said in chapter 4 and verse 2. God is gracious, like he was to Paul. God is merciful, the nature of God that Jonah described. Uh, mercy is showing compassion for the weak, for the needy, the hungry, the poor. If you're merciful, you care about them, you try to help them. I think of Simon Peter, how he cursed and swore that he never knew the Lord. Uh, have you ever been cursed? Some of us have, I guess. And we know how disgusting it is and, and how it is feels to be treated in such a fashion. Our Lord was cursed by Peter and three times denied that he ever knew him. And yet the Lord turns to him and says that he welcomes Peter into uh, becoming the first preacher on Pentecost, uh, the preaches to the first Gentiles, Cornelius, goes on missionary journeys, writes books, he comes back after weeping bitterly and is forgiven. Yes, God is merciful, and Peter's a great example of that. In Exodus 20 and verse 6, that he would show mercy unto thousands. Micah 6 and verse 8, what doth the Lord require thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with the Lord thy God? Colossians 3 and 12, Paul says to the church that we should have bowels of mercies. Jonah knew that God was merciful. We as Christians are to have bowels of mercies. Third of all, Jonah said, I knew you were gracious, I knew you were merciful, and I knew that you were slow to anger. And once again, we say, thank you, Lord. Praise God that he has a... It takes a lot for the anger of God to be displayed. That is a personality some people have, and others are... Just quick to fly off the handle, as we say, country-wise. Uh, they do not have any patience. They're, they're quick-tempered. They're short-tempered. Others are easy-going and takes a lot to get them upset. They're, they're slow to anger. God's slow to anger. Jonah knew that. And Paul Peter, yes, James, look at right in a minute. James 1 and 19 says that we should be such that would be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, swift to hear. God's nature is that he is 
has is slow to anger. We have the great story in Genesis 18 where our father told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, of course, his, ne his nephew lives there and his family. And Abraham raises two great questions in Genesis 18. He said, are you going to destroy the, the righteous with the wicked? Really? And, and, and shall not the, the judge of all the earth do what's right? Would you spare the city for 50 righteous souls? Our father said, I will. For 40? I will. 45? I will. 30? Gets down to 30. He says, now, I, I know I'm, I'm talking to you, Lord, and I'm just dust and ashes, and, and I don't want to make you angry. I hope I don't make you angry, Lord. Verse 30, uh, Genesis 18, hope I don't make you angry, but, but would you do it for 30? I will. I'll spare him for 30. 20? Yeah, for 20. 10? If I can find 10 righteous? Yes, for 10. Our God is slow to anger. Our God uh, is merciful. Our God is gracious. Our God is kind. Well, Jonah knew these things about the nature of God by observation. Jonah had a bad attitude, and he hopefully gained a great lesson from our father of not being the way that he was and seeing the true value of things and the value of a soul, how precious. Your soul is precious too, whatever your needs may be. I don't know if there's anyone here today that, that needs to obey the gospel. Is it possible that there's someone here that needs to be restored to the Lord? I, I think so. You know the nature of God. He is long-suffering. He is good. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is kind. Why not take advantage of that goodness? Why, why test it? Why delay when we, our soul is at stake, our eternity to be with God, His nature is good. But even the patience of God can wear thin. So please, while there's time and opportunity, do something about your understanding of the nature of God like Jonah. Get our attitudes right and our application of things correct as Jonah had to learn the hard way so that we can be with the Lord. If we can assist you, it's your decision. We pray you'll make it now as we stand and sing.